Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to the Finding You podcast. I'm Dr. Brad Reedy. Today is Tuesday, November 5th, 2024. Hope you had your chance to vote today. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the family of origin. I'm going to be talking about it in a couple of ways from a couple of perspectives, both as it relates to our family of origin and how that shapes us and the family of origin that we've created for our children. Uh, th this comes largely from my study in family systems theory. For those of you who don't know and don't pay attention to these kinds of details, my PhD and master's degree actually are both in marriage and family therapy, which is an approach that comes from various fields, but really is a reaction against individual psychology and talks about how uh, behavior and, and, and the human condition can be asked, best be understand, best be understood in groups, uh, specifically the family. Before I get into that, the one thing I want to talk about tonight is our Finding You Intensives. I believe we have a spot or two left for our upcoming intensives. So if you are interested and waiting for a time, especially during the holidays, now is the time. Our Finding You Intensives, our, 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 our in-person intensive is a four-day, four-and-a-half-day immersive experience looking at your family of origin and really getting a sense of how it shapes you. I've talked to folks recently who, who refer to the fact that they've attended family intensives in other circumstances and situations. The individual intensive, the, the Finding You Intensive, our flagship program, is not psychoeducation. This is not just being in a group with other people and learning about yourself. This is a really powerful, immersive, experiential therapeutic experience. So you can expect to really create a, an accelerator for your therapy. So if you're finding yourself stuck in psychotherapy, finding you is a wonderful way to accelerate and get yourself unstuck. And if you're looking for a springboard into what your work is, if you're open to the idea, finding you is a wonderful opportunity to really get a good sense of what your project is, the way I like to say it. So our upcoming programs, November 15th through 17th is our online version. That's three days, two and a half days. That is about uh, half the time and about a third of the cost, and you don't have to travel. So if money and time are scarce for you right now, the online option is fantastic. I will be running this particular in-person intensive. Our next one is December 4th through 8th. That's the one where we have a spot or two left. If you're interested in this, or any of our intensive work or our coaches, you can always reach out to us at info at findingyouprograms.com. This is one of my favorite quotes from Tion Dayton. She is a psychodramatist expert considered by many to be one of the most re renowned psychodramatists in the world. She, she talks heavily in the context of addiction and recovery. She comes from a family where there was multi-generations of trauma, and she talks about it very openly. And she says this in her book, Emotional Sobriety. She writes, Our children don't become who we tell them to be. They become who we are. As a therapist, I need no convincing that the children live, that children live in the affective space between their parents. They live in their unspoken and sometimes unfelt emotional world. Much of parenting is implicit rather than explicit, which is why children become who we are rather than who we tell them to be. Our children drink us up like little sponges. We are showing them who we want them to become. If there's one idea tonight that I want you to take away, both as somebody who comes from a family of origin and somebody who has created, we call it the family of, of procreation uh, and the family of origin for your children. If there's one idea I, I want you to take away tonight, it is that the processes, the way we operate in our families has so much more of an impact on us than the individual events. So when somebody comes to me and they're trying to discover their trauma and they may be able to point to one or two overt explicit events, I will often point out to them that yes, that, that happened and yes, that was traumatic. And yes, we should unpack and uncover that. But really what I want to know is what happened in and around all of that. And if it was something that happened from one of your parents, how is this event, this instance, symbolic of a process? So we're really talking about the way you grew up, what it was like. And this is invisible. I think one of the most difficult things to understand about small T trauma, as it's often referred to compared to big T trauma, the big events in our life, is that there's no real story to tell with small T trauma. It's almost not discernible. You can only see it by, by who we've become. That is why, and I'm going to say this one last time tonight, 
That is why I really like our process and our finding you intensive where you do a, you create a role play, a psychodrama with your family of origin from the past and you have a conversation with them and you tell us how they, they would have reacted, how you imagine they would have reacted to you when you were a young child or when you were a child. And it is that reaction that tells me more than any specific event. So this is process over event. This is parenting relationships, roles, rules, communication, the way that our parents think over the specific things that happened to us that we can recall. And I love the way that Tian Dion writes about that. I talk about it in terms of the soup that we were cooked in. And specifically, I took this from the audacity to be you. When we grow up in a home where the project is to be right, just to use one example, then we feel we must make a case for everything we want, everything we do. We debate with others, proven the validity of our choices and our preferences. The processes that differentiate the two styles are subtle and more like a continuum than a binary. It is in the air that we breathe. I often refer to the way that we are raised as, quote, the soup that we are cooked in, unquote. If we are seen as children, we would have a better sense of ourselves as adults. When we were tired, we would sleep. When we were hungry, we would eat. If we found ourselves in a relationship or a situation that asked us to compromise critical aspects of ourselves, we would let the relationship go or remove ourselves from the situation. So I, I think this speaks to why psychotherapy in, in many ways is the foundation of our transformation more than psychoeducation. Psychoeducation uh, props up or, or, or is a great anchor to, to the deeper work, but the real work is uncovering the emotional field that we carry within ourselves, the way that we've been taught to think and operate in the world, the way we respond to other people, the way we expect other people to respond to us. So going into family systems theory and family of origin this evening, I want to talk about a few of my favorite principles and pioneers from the model. I love the idea in systems theory. First of all, the idea in systems theory is that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts and that you can punctuate somebody's behavior, a cyclical interaction, any way you want to. But the punctuation is arbitrary and contrived. I could say that I yelled at my wife and so she stopped talking to me for days. So then I became passive aggressive. So then she felt guilty. I could describe it that way, but I could start the story anywhere along the story. So when we're telling our stories, we're, we're really just telling a, a fragment of our story, even in psychotherapy. There's a context in which that beginning point occurred. And, and there are multiple influences on behaviors that, that come from the ecosystem, right? The culture, our, our peers. And so while I place so much emphasis on, on our parents and on us as parents, and I do that because as parents, that's the only thing that we have any kind of control over when it comes to our children. But when I talk about parents and children, it's important to understand that the ecosystems that are at play, the culture, the zeitgeist, that it is a part of the current situation or the situation that we're referring to has a dramatic impact. In punctuation, we talk about the idea of equal, potential, equal potentiality and equal finality. And what that means is somebody can come from the same similar situation and they can end up in very different places. Somebody can and can grow up wealthy and well off. And they can use that background, that springboard, as a way to serve the greater good. Somebody could also grow up wealthy and well off and could use that start to indulge themselves in materialism and in and, and, and hedonism. Right? You can come from an abusive family where you yourself were sexually or physically abused and you can recreate the abuse in the next generation. Or you can change the story. You can change the narrative. You can become a social worker. You can become an advocate for other children. So you can start from the same place and end up in very different places. And then equal finality is that idea that you can end up in the same place from two different situations. So you might meet somebody who is a kind person, uh, a friendly person, an outgoing person, a, a well-balanced person. You might compare that to a very similarly mature person, and you find out that one comes from 
a relatively intact, healthy, stable family life, and one comes from chaos and abuse or neglect. So systems theory is an attempt to, to, to make things as complicated and nuanced as they are. What drew me to it, I thought this was interesting today as I was preparing these, these slides for my talk this evening. What drew me to it the most as a child, and that's where I was first introduced to the idea of family systems theory in my own family therapy setting as a child, was that I wasn't the only one. I, it de-emphasizes the, the identified patient as the problem. The identified patient in family systems theory is the symptom bearer, is the one that speaks out for something that's broken in the entire system. Family systems theory says that the individual and the behavior or the symptom in the individual individual is just a manifestation of a systemic problem or issue. And of course, as a, as a child, I was really attracted to that. I didn't want to be the problem. And, and I was just talking about this with my family the other day, the family of procreation that I have now. And I was thinking about my mother and, and my, my child, and I was thinking, I was I was pinned, labeled as this angry, defiant kid. And that's true. I was. I, I qualified. I checked all the boxes for that. But if anybody had been there, and I had responded to it, I, I should say, if anyone had been there to see that my anger was at the hypocrisy, at the, the lack of accountability on my mother and my father's part, the fact that I was the, the scapegoat for the sins of my family, of my system. I remember one time... This is a really rare moment for me. When I was struggling with substance abuse, my grandfather, who was a functional alcoholic, as far as I can tell, most of his life, very successful career, very stable, very stoic, but was a, an absolute daily drinker, often to the point of intoxication. And I remember one time I was, he was driving me to the dentist. He was covering for my mother, who, who usually passed that off to my grandmother, but for some reason, she was unavailable that day. So my grandfather had, had the rare charge of taking me to the dentist or, or the orthodontist that day. And along the way, he just said to me, why do you use drugs? And it seemed to be a very honest question without a, an agenda. And I paused for a moment. I said, probably the same reason that you drink. I, I do it to feel better. In many ways, I, I do it to cope with something that feels out of control. I do, I do it to, to get a sense that I'm safe and okay. I didn't become that articulate. But when I answered that I, I probably do it for the same reason that you do, my grandfather, as, as perfect as he was made out to be in my family of origin, took that in really, really well. And, 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 and there was very little exchange between us, but I felt seen. It didn't devolve into what it would have with my mother where we would have gotten to a fight, a debate about who was worse and who was managing their stuff and who was the victim and, and, and so forth and so on. Family system theory does not place a great deal of energy on discovering the etiology of problems. It doesn't really care so much. It just cares about what's happening. It doesn't care about why. It focuses on what's reinforcing and maintaining the dance. It de-emphasizes blame and it is now present and forward thinking in many ways. So tonight, in some respect, I'm going to be borrowing from other theories as I look back and I talk about our histories and the histories that we're creating for our children. Family systems theory looks at all influences on a system and its parts. The child, for example, will have as much impact on the parent's behavior as is the case in reverse. That's one wonderful contribution of family systems theory is if you have a child that's neurodivergent, that's going to affect your connection, your attachment. If you have a child that is that struggles with various disorders or diseases, that's going to impact you. That's going to going to affect your ability to patient in such a way as to provide a secure attachment. So uh, it, it's non-judgmental. It's a, impactful. This idea of looking through ourselves through the lens of family systems theory and our family of origin. Individual models often preached and teached. They suggested in family systems theory that pathology and the cause and the cure came and could be best understood by studying the individual. And, and for most of the history 
of treating mental illness in the world, people were separated individually. The family was not brought into the system. They might meet in groups in asylums or mental health hospitals, or, or later on as we progressed in, in residential treatment centers and treatment programs and so forth, but they didn't bring the family in for a long time until really we started to think about computers and, and, and systems in a more complex way. The idea in, in previous systems theory is that something is best understood by dissecting it or, or, or reducing it down to its smallest parts. And then in individual therapy, like I've said, there was an emphasis on the past. Oftentimes the interventions were very primitive. They would be, it would be surgery. It would be locked away in asylums with very little effective or, or evidence-based treatment, of course, because it was, we, we, we didn't have the knowledge that we have now. Like I said, they were in groups, but it was not a relationship focus. There's a, there's a movie that I saw recently that I would recommend to anybody listening, if you're interested, as I look at the history of individual therapy, it's called the three Christs. It's not a religious movie. It's based on a true story written by a psychiatrist who had three clients in New York city, I think in the 1950s, I want to say who all identified themselves as Jesus Christ. And it is the, the true story or based on the true story of his work with them over several years. And it's, it's, it's beautiful, wonderful. If you're looking for something, Richard Gere is the doctor is the star of it. And somehow I missed it when it came out, but saw, saw it recently and absolutely loved it. In ecosystems theory, we understand how the greater systems work. How does the school system affect our child? How does the cultural, the, the, the financial system, our community, our religious system that we may or may not belong to? I live in Utah, and the impact of the, the, the Mormon culture in Utah is profound on families that aren't, some of which aren't even members of that faith. So ecosystems helps, again, put another piece to that puzzle. When young girls are looking at beauty magazines, what are they learning? That's not taught by the parent or TikTok or, or social media is maybe even more relevant these days. Like I said, family systems theory was a reaction against individually focused model models. It's kind of like comparing Newtonian science, Newtonian physics to quantum theory and quantum physics. Everything in the Newtonian theory was very linear, very easily explained. But as we became more aware and we could see more things and more and more science came about, we understand that there are great paradoxes, that two particles can, can be related to each other when they are very far away from each other, that light is both a particle and a wave, which doesn't make any sense. So quantum theory explains in a way, metaphorically, what we're talking about with family systems, that it's complex. It's all interconnected. And that's why sometimes in family systems, the interventions are just meant to, 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 to disrupt the patterns, to disrupt the cycles. Try something different. Try eating at a different time. Try eating all together. And somebody might say, well, what does that have to do with substance abuse? Or what does that have to do with depression? But those little systemic changes ask each person in the system to rethink their position in the family. And like I said, this came out of cybernetics, the study of computers and complex sy symptoms. A couple of big contributions that I think are very applicable to us. In Palo Alto, California, there was a, there still is uh, a program called the Mental Research Institute. It was associated with Stanford, but, but separate. And there in the 1970s, they began to study 1960s and 70s. They began to study families. They put closed circuit cameras in families and watched them. Sometimes they would just have observers, scientists standing. They wouldn't intervene, but they would just stand in a corner and observe and, and, and take notes. And a couple of the, the simple ideas that they came away with in watching families was it wasn't, and this is so important for us as, as parents and, and children ourselves, it wasn't so much the event that dictated whether or not the family was going to suffer some kind of mental health issue or crisis. A parent losing their job, somebody getting sick, somebody not making the team or getting a failing grade, those didn't predict the mental health crisis. 
what predicted the mental health crisis they thought they observed was how people thought about it, how they conceptualized the issue. And I think everybody can understand that, right? If you see it as an opportunity to grow, you're going to have a different relationship with that. If you see it in the context of, of maybe even your faith, for example, you're going to have a different relationship. So what they started to do was simply reframe. A, a classic example of reframing that one of my professors in school taught, taught us about was where he was taking a client, he was working on a, on a brief family systems model, and he had a, a client that had become absolutely phobic about driving a car after a horrible accident that they survived. And over time and work, they eventually got to the point where the, the therapist took the client to the junkyard where the car was, where, where it had been totaled. And he had the client look at the, the, the absolute devastation, the, the, the total destruction of the car. And the therapist was able to say, you see, this car took all of the damage so that you could be standing here next to me walking alive. So you're thinking of the car as the thing that caused the, the problem, the accident. And in a way, the, the car was the thing that saved your life, the thing that protected you from the collision. And he said, for the most part, that, that reframe that they had worked up to made all the difference in the world in terms of this phobic response this person was having. So it's how we reframe, how we think about. I was playing with the idea just recently. I'm going to be giving a keynote address in Florida this coming Sunday. And I was playing with the idea with my team about there's a part of me that wants to sometime do an exercise where I, I tell audience members that if they, they don't ask a question or they ask a question that in itself doesn't take into consideration this, this bigger idea that I'm teaching, then I would gently ask them to re-ask the question. In other words, that's a very convoluted way to say I'm trying to teach us how to think differently about our children, about ourselves, about our participation, about our shame, about our relationships, about intimacy. As so many people remark, enlightenment, maturity is more unlearning what we were taught than it is the acquiring of new knowledge. I love when clients get to a point in a relationship with their spouse, with their child, with their parent, with their relative. I love when they get to a point where they say, I don't know what to say anymore. I don't know what to do with my hands anymore. And invariably in those moments, I compliment them and I say, that's a really good sign. I can remember parents trying to line up their, their letter to, to the child that they were writing in the treatment program that I worked at. I can remember them pausing and hesitating and struggling to find out how to relate to their child anymore, giving these, these new rules and ideas around communication that we had been presenting to them. And, and at first I wanted to apologize. I didn't want them to feel stuck. That's what I felt when I was young. But as I grew older and more experienced, I thought this is a good sign. And, and even if it makes you feel absolutely powerless and helpless, that's a good sign. That would be something to relate to your child about. I'm sure in many ways, that's how they feel in the therapeutic process. So going back to the idea in our family of origin of the difference between events, specific incidences, and the process. Like I said, it wasn't the death, the illness, the loss of job, the learning disability, or the divorce or the family addiction that made the difference. It was how the family was organized around those things, how they communicated. I, I shared this before. I don't know if you've seen it. I, I'm not endorsing it by any means. But I watched a few seasons of the television show Yellowstone, and there are portions of that have, that have incredible writing. Not the entire thing, but there are portions of it that have an, an incredible writing. And there's a particular scene where the adult daughter, I believe her name is Beth, the adult daughter is finally confessing many, many years, decades later, to her father that she'd had an abortion when she was a teenager. And she was full of shame, of course, and fear about how he would react. He was a very stoic cowboy, played by Kevin Costner. And as she, through her tears, apologized to her father for not telling her, Kevin Costner in his character said something so profound. He said, you don't need to apologize to me. 
It should be I that's apologizing to you. Because if I was the kind of father that you didn't feel safe coming and sharing this with, then I was the one who failed. And that's what I'm talking about. See, families that have healthy processes raise children who don't suffer from big T trauma as much. And that's strange. Because family processes don't erase the big T trauma. But they give the child a way of dealing with it and coping with it. But if we don't have the ability to calm our own nervous system, if we don't have... The, the, if we don't take the responsibility for our own nervous systems and our anxiety, then when our child is struggling or something bad happens to them, we become, if you will, unavailable to the child for what they need, which is co-regulation. I was describing to a client just today that I had this intense phobia of needles as a child. And I learned that from watching my older brother absolutely freak out and panic whenever he had to get a shot. Not his fault, don't blame him in, in a shame-based way. But I learned, oh, that if he's four and a half years older than me. If he's terrified of needles, I definitely should be terrified of needles. You see, I learned how to be, not from what my parents told me, not from the doctor or the nurse told me. I learned it in the effective space in this instance, not even between my parents, but between the other members of my family. I learned how to be by watching and feeling my brother. So it's more important in parenting. It's more important even on our own therapy when we lack, look back on it. It's more important to dissect and understand the processes in our family than it is in a certain way to think about the specific incidents, incidences. People often look for the big T. When I get a new client, they want to know what their trauma is. Makes sense, right? I talk about it. Everybody talks about it now. But what's more important than the big T trauma in my experience, and the research suggests the same, is all of the stuff that happens in and around before and after the event. So the processes in our families, for good or for bad, become a kind of mitigating factor. They, they moderate the effects of the big T trauma. If roles are flexible and open, age appropriate and clear, boundaries are clear, hierarchy is clear, the parents are clear about their position, things go better. Even when children become the victim to something that, that the parent has nothing to do with, things go better. When rules are clear and overt, when everybody's clear about who's taking care of whom, when, when, when everybody in the family, specifically starting with the parents, takes the responsibility for their own nervous system regulation, everything else is less important. In, in I'm going to be talking about this tonight. This is leading up to tonight's broadcast. This is leading up to my favorite subject in family systems theory, family of origin, is to talk about differentiation. In my experience, after doing this for 30 years, the most important variable that I look for in families is the closeness. How close are people without becoming fused, without becoming enmeshed? If I am upset, how much does that affect my family? Are they empathic, sensitive, and open? Are they triggered? Do they get depressed? Do they get anxious? All of that that I just described is what I look for when I'm meeting with an individual or family. So we talk about this balance between being close, but being separate at the same time. Maintaining your sovereignty as a self, but still having sensitivity and empathy for, for others in the, in the family. And I'll talk more about that as we go. Does the family foster the development of self? We talk about in family of origin very, very often, we talk about the early stages of the child's development. Were we taken care of? Were we responded to? Were our needs met consistently and regularly? And if they were, that's a good thing. And if they weren't, that's a really hard thing to recover with. Children whose needs aren't taken care of in those early stages end up 
distrusting the world, end up feeling like the world is out to get them, end up feeling done to. Right? Do you have a child that feels done to? Do you feel done to? So does it develop that, that early secure attachment? But there's a second part to secure attachment that I don't talk about as often, which is, is the child during the, the, the phase of identity development, adolescence, which is sometime around 12-ish to around 25-ish when we talk about brain science, that's the adolescent brain, period. Is the child and the parent, are they able to separate, to, to launch? And again, a lot of things go into that. Not the least of which, a child who is acting out dangerously, it's going to be nearly impossible for most parents to allow that child to separate. But the question becomes, is the acting out a function of the poor separation process that was occurring previously? That's the systemic question. That's the, the, the arbitrary punctuation. What came first, the chicken or the egg, as you, as you will? Does the system develop, support, and facilitate the development of individual selves? I could also talk about that in terms of if we raise our children to be good something or others. If we were raised, and by the way, let's just go back to us. If we were raised to be good, if we were raised that, that you had to be right to have a boundary, you had to justify yourself, that's not being a person. That's being a thing. That's being a right and a good. That's being plastic. When we talk about healthy child development, I'm talking about ours. We talk about growing up in a family where you didn't need to be right, where it was okay how you felt. Boundaries were still in place. Boundaries were still clear. Our parents still had a, a fundamental sense of themselves. Some awareness, some compassion, some empathy, some flexibility. But we were seen. Our internal world mattered and was heard and held. The family of origin gives us a place for belonging. Does it provide that? Do we feel like we fit in? When I run family, uh, when I run the family of origin portion of our Finding You Intensive, our flagship program, I'll, I would say 75% of the participants will talk about this feeling of being alone, being misunderstood, not being seen, being the outcast, not fitting in. Sometimes it's in school, but oftentimes it, it relates to the family of origin. Does the family give us a place for belonging? You know, I don't talk these days about healthy communication often. It's because I, I as I talk about often, I, I don't really think of mental health in terms of the doing things. Because the doing thing doesn't really tell me about the family. It's the energy involved. It's the idea. It's the reason behind it. A hammer I have always taught can be used to build a house or destroy a house. It can be used as a weapon. So the, the tool has no intrinsic value. And I think early in my career, as I emphasized communication skills and, and, and I feel statements and reflective listening, which I still think have their place and value. But as that became my emphasis, I saw many parents not children, weaponize those. I saw many children weaponize those against each other. And believe me, as a therapist, married to a therapist, with children who are therapists, you better believe that all of us know how to weaponize skills and tools. One of the biggest predictors of all the good things is our parents' self-awareness. It must be my own algorithm on social media, but as I was planning today and taking a break and scrolling to give myself a little bit of time and space, I saw a lot of quotes around this idea of parent self-awareness. What would it be like if you went back to your parents, if you could time travel back to your fourth or your fifth grade year of life? What is that? Seven, eight years old, something like that. What would, what would it be like if you could go back to that parent, that version of your parent? And, and advocate for yourself and tell them how you feel. What would happen now if you told them how, how you felt? And the, the stuff I've been seeing on social media, again, my algorithm tends to show a lot of self-help and psychology stuff. I, I get a lot of quotes and a lot of ideas from it. I have some great, great accounts that I follow. But my algorithm today was showing me the defensiveness of parents. Parents 
playing the victim role, not wanting to hear it, justifying themselves, anything except for accepting it and honoring that, that child's story. And of course, attachment, listening, holding the child. The parent is to take in the child. The parent is supposed to be bigger than us. Structural family therapy was created by a man by the name of Salvador Mnuchin. One of the, the areas that started off fa understanding family of origin and family systems theory. He worked in the Philadelphia Child Guidance Clinic in the 1970s. He studied families with identified patients, with patients who had medical conditions, specifically anorexic and diabetic families. And he saw blood levels spike based on the levels uh, or drop based on the levels of conflict in the family. He began to make the connection between these, what, what we thought at the time were purely medical individual issues, something now that is more widespread and more well-known that, that the anorexia or the diabetes would be best understood, perhaps only understood in the context of a family system. Children will create physical symptoms. I, I, I've said this before. I have multiple sclerosis. This is a true story. I have multiple sclerosis. I have MS. And, and it's being treated effectively and has been for the, the several years that I've had it now. I was diagnosed in 2015. And you wouldn't know it unless I told you that I had it because the medication is working so well. But I will tell you to this point that I believe that part of the reason that I have this autoimmune disease where my body is attacking itself is related to the family of origin that I grew up, the dynamics that I grew up, the inability to, to take care of myself, the inability to, to ask for help. My experience that I have to do it all on my own, that I feel ashamed when my, when my needs burden other people. I feel terrified when my needs burden other people. I'm reluctant to express anything that might lead to conflict. And because of all of that, that avoidance that I'm describing, because the way that my mother operated, my father operated, I internalized it. I held on to it. And like many, many people, my psychological context contributed to a physiological disorder. It can happen with ulcers, migraines, other chronic illnesses, other autoimmune diseases, cancer, right? It's not, it doesn't explain the whole picture, but it's a part of the picture. So he started to talk about boundaries. That's what he observed. Like I observed differentiation that I'll talk about a little bit later. He saw boundaries as the thing. He was the one who coined the, the, the phrase boundaries and, and some of the other phrase that you probably use in your therapeutic language all the time. He talked about rules. More importantly, the implicit rules. Like don't be mad at mom and dad. Don't blame mom and dad. I talk about this all the time. When I meet with individuals who are very reluctant to do historical work, one of my questions, one of my suspicions, if you will, is that they are still supporting the ego of their parents. They are implicitly enrolled in, in this, this, this job to support the parents' idea of their own goodness. They've been told if you look back, it's a waste of time. You're being a victim. And of course, that is not at all true. Looking back doesn't get you stuck. It helps you move through it. It helps you develop self-compassion. It helps give meaning and, 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 and structure to your, your reactions to people and situations and circumstances today. Flexibility was valued between children. You know, there, there's no, there's a saying that there's no, no two children in the world ever have had the same parent, but no parent has the same child even more so. So what might work for your eight-year-old doesn't work for your 14-year-old. What might work for your 14-year-old doesn't work for that same child when they're 17. So there has to be a flexibility, a way to think about it that's outside of this dogmatic, simplistic, um, kind of uh, absolutely um, universal template. You have to think through it. You have to relearn. You have to let go. You have to change. You have to evolve. Hierarchy, understanding that, that, that the parents, even, even in situations where the family is very democratic, ultimately that's a parent parental decision. A, a healthy family means that the parents take a position 
of responsibility for the children, for the family. It's not autocratic. It's not a dictatorship. It's a consideration of everybody else. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's the parent's responsibility. And, and how is the executive system functioning? How are the co-parents functioning? Alliances, coalitions, intergenerational violations. You've heard of things like parentifying a child. You know, people will talk about, I felt like my, my, my mother's or my father's spouse. They would complain to me about the, the, you know, my other parent or the ex, you know, their ex partner. They involved me in discussions that would have been better had with other adults. They relied on me for their self-esteem. Gives the child too much responsibility, too much pressure, and it doesn't go well for everybody. Another theorist that I'll be talking about even more, Murray Bowen. Now, Murray Bowen is interesting because Murray Bowen was a medical doctor. And he supervised other medical doctors. He is considered, like Salvador Mnuchin, one of the founders of family therapy. There's, there's a handful, maybe 10 or 12 that we think about when we think about the professionals who studied and codified family systems in our family of origin. And Murray Bowen, Dr. Bowen, um, never met with two people at the same time. So again, thinking about your family of origin doesn't mean that we bring your mother and your father and your siblings into therapy with you necessarily, although that can happen. But it means we understand you, we conceptualize you in the context of those other people in your family. So he would watch his medical students doing supervision with them in various rotations, and oftentimes it would lead to their own personal lives. And as he was teaching them about healthy structures and, and boundaries and differentiation and, and a sense of self, all the things that I'm talking about tonight, these students would go back and, and visit their home, visit their family, and they would come back and tell stories. Murray Bowen himself, for example, tells several stories where he would go to his family. He had his father, I believe the story goes like this. His father called him once and started venting about his mother. So after he hung up the phone with his father, he called his mother. They were still married at the time, I believe. And said, your husband just called me and was talking about you. And that was the last time his father ever, ever confided in Dr. Bowen about, about his wife, about, about Dr. Bowen's mother. He stopped triangulation. He stopped, he didn't want to be in the executive system. He stopped being the outlet for the anxiety and the undone work between them. He coined the term triangle in that way. He talked about differentiation. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. He talked about this idea of a family ego mass. And that's really the crux of what I'm getting to tonight. A family ego mass is where you all fit on the differentiation scale. In your family, if somebody's upset your family growing up if somebody was upset how is everybody else in the family supposed to respond to that do they ignore that person do they shame that person and gaslight that person do they try to fix that person do they feel responsible so the family ego mass is the level at which the entire family operates in terms of its connectedness and separateness we call that differentiation if somebody's mad at me, can I remain separate from that and still be empathic to that? That's differentiation or the question of differentiation. So family ego mass, and he gave it a number. It was arbitrary from scale to, from, from zero to 100. And he would talk about families that operate at a 75 or a 45 or a 50. And I'll talk about that. Anxiety is a big thing. Anxiety in the parents. I thought about this today, especially with this election. The stress that all of us feel around cultural, societal, political issues, and there are many, and I'm not going to spend and waste my time taking a position this evening on anything like that. The, the global warming, right? The, 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 whatever's happening in the world. If we're scared and we're not getting help for that fear, we're leaking that onto our children. Similarly, if our parents were scared about, I know my mother was scared about finances, being a single mother. There was some conversation in my family of origin uh, during the Cold War about a nuclear war. And I learned, I learned what the world was like. I learned how safe or not it was. 
Parental anxiety isn't the death sentence. Unowned parental anxiety for a child is absolutely devastating to the child. And most parents are, are, are unaware because they experience their worry as love. They actually tell their child often. I'm not angry. I'm not scared. I don't doubt you. I just love you. I'm doing this out of love. Now, I do believe that there's love there. That's part of the equation. But there's absolutely, there's anxiety there too. So the best thing that any parent can do for their child is to take responsibility for their own anxiety. To not leak that onto the child. Intergenerational transmission is how these things get passed on. In my own family, my mother went to therapy a little bit when I was younger. That made me comfortable with therapy. I go to therapy a lot. That makes my children extremely comfortable with therapy. Have I fixed every intergenerational pathology in my, in my familial lineage? Absolutely not. Couldn't expect to. But I've made a turn. And my children and their children will be better for it. Clear communication, like I mentioned. Family therapy can happen with individuals. Most of my therapy is with individuals. But even though I'm talking to an individual, I'm talking about their family of origin, I'm talking about their upbringing, I'm seeing them through the lens of their earliest contexts. That's what I call it these days. Homeostasis is a systemic principle that um, a system seeks to maintain the status quo. So even if you change and get healthier, in fact, this is most often when homeostasis is brought up. If you change and get healthier, if your child changes and get healthier, the system will try to pull you back to the old way. I think that's one of the most important takeaways from family systems theory is homeostasis. For all of you listening tonight, if you take steps toward greater health and wholeness, your family members will resist that change because it affects them. It takes them out of their comfort zone, out of their old patterns. Attempted solution sequences is a, a term in, in family systems theory to help us understand how families try to solve problems. And the idea is that everything that we call pathology, everything that we call mental illness, if we look at it closely enough, is an attempt to deal with some other problem. Substance use is an attempt to deal with anxiety or depression or trauma or any number of things. So attempted solution sequences is a compassionate way to look at behavior. Reframing, disrupting the system is an important way to kind of change. You make one change in a system here and watch the entire system reorganize, recalibrate. Similar to attempted so solution sequences, a function of the system... Uh, having a hard time with some of these tonight. A function of the symptom is a way of understanding how the symptom serves the whole family. If a child has a substance use disorder developing, maybe the family needs to work on communication. Maybe the family of origin has unconsciously placed all of their, 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 their baggage on this, this child that might be the truth teller, might be the most sensitive may be the most reactive to the family of origin cycles and systemic, systemic issues. So understanding the identified patient, the rules, roles. Um, we generally create the same dynamics in our family of origin. Not, you know, it's funny because I, I tell the story of my first wife and my second wife who are both named Michelle who both come from families where they're the second born with an older sibling and an adopted third child. Both of my wife's fathers went to uh, Stanford and studied business. I mean, the, 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 they both have dark brown curly hair. They're both, I mean, the, the similarities are many. So it's kind of humorous to, to remember that when I was marrying the second Michelle, that I thought I had married a completely different human being. And in some ways she was. In some ways, she was a, a, a good fit for me at that time. But the, the fundamental, the, the deepest issues 
from my family of origin were still at play. And I had no idea. I had no idea that I was marrying my, my wife to fix her and she was marrying to fix me. We had no idea. We just thought we were in love. So there are aspects of my personality that remind us both of her mother and father, her upbringing. I felt like home to her. And there are parts of her that remind me of my home. Right? I'm, I'm attracted to what is familiar. And we recreate these patterns until we repair, we heal. Then we take ourselves out of the cycle, out of the system, out of the old ways of coping. And it is terrifying and difficult and painstaking. And it takes a long time. This is marathon stuff, folks. This is not sprint stuff. If there's one, in my opinion, if there's one error that, that's made in pop psychology these days more than maybe anything else, it's this idea that you know one insight, one therapy session, one intervention can change somebody's personality fundamentally. That is extraordinarily rare, if not impossible. Because the overwhelming impact of our family of origin and how it shaped us is so much bigger than any one idea, any one insight, any one intervention. And our, our nervous systems are hardwired in our family of origin. Our brains, the human brain, is especially vulnerable and, and plastic during the first 25 years of life. And therefore, what happens to it during that time is incredibly predictive of the kinds of relationships and patterns and issues that come up later. I love the story of from, from Columbia that I share in the audacity of you about the, the mice experiment. They take baby mice and separate them into two categories and group one, they shock these baby mice and they pair the shock with a peppermint smell. So the baby mice begin to associate the shock with the peppermint smell. And in group number two, they do the exact same thing that I just said, shock the babies, pair it with a peppermint smell. The only difference in, 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 in number two is the baby mouse is with its mother. Later on, when the mice grow up, they release them into these mazes that experimental psychologists love to use. And at the end of each of the, the, the canals, the tubes, these little uh, mazes that these mice have to go through, there's different smells, different scents. But here's what's fascinating. In group number one, where the mice were shocked by themselves, they never go to the peppermint smell. Never. And in group number two, where the mouse, same, same pairing, the mice were shocked with the, paired with the peppermint smell, the difference being that as they were with their mothers, the mice always go toward the peppermint smell. It's a simple explanation with a simpler life form to show that attachment trumps trauma. So if your attachment was chaotic, you're going to be attracted to chaos. If your uh, attachment was loud and dramatic and demonstrative, that's who you're going to be attracted to. If your trauma was abandonment like mine, you're going to be attracted to contexts and relationships where nobody's there for your needs and you're not going to ask. And this is not... This is not bad news. None of this is bad news. None of this is, is a negative prognosis. This is the truth about human beings. We develop in relationship, but we can heal in new relationships. We can re-experience in our, ourselves in, a, in an Al-Anon group, in an AA group with a good therapist. You can re-experience yourself by listening to this podcast. Because when I talk about myself or you or us together, in ways that were different from your family of origin, you start to see yourself differently. You start to reorient yourself towards yourself in a fundamentally different way. So we're attracted to, to pieces that feel like home. We're searching for, that's why it's so intoxicating when we fall in love. Because we, we've, we're only seeing the good parts of our spouse at that time. Right? We're, we're blind and psychotically, delusionally unaware of the, the problems and the issues. We just see the positive. And it feels like home. It feels magical. And then we get married 
And then the work for a soulmate begins, as I like to say. We seek for needs to get that, that went unmet in childhood. So much of our parenting, so much of my mother's parenting toward me, so much of my father's parenting is we try to give our children what we didn't get. Everybody I talk to talks about this. If your children seem particularly unresponsive to your needs, you're likely going to struggle with overindulging your children. You're going to re re correct the problem to a fault. Unless, of course, you do your own healing, or to the extent that you do your own healing, then you can respond from an adult position. Secondarily, we often ask our children to take care of us in the ways that our parents were supposed to. Children don't owe us unconditional love. If anything, when they are born, we owe them. Not the other way around. But the child is helpless and, and vulnerable and wants the proximity of their caregivers. So they will give up parts of themselves that, that threaten the parent, that expose the parent, that cause the parent to have to look at parts of themselves that they don't want to deal with or they're afraid of looking at. And so we have to do our own work so that our children unconsciously aren't enrolled in the position of doing and, and taking care of us in ways that, that should have been done in our own childhood. When old patterns become healed, old, old traumas, old issues become healed and evolved, they become uninteresting to us. However old you are, I assume most of my audience is, is older, but think of what you were attracted to 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. You're not attracted to the same thing. You run in different circles, right? We, we change, we grow, hopefully. If you're the same person now that you were 30 or 40 years ago, I'd make the argument you might have wasted 30 or 40 years. Old people, old patterns become uninteresting to us. And most of us try to solve it by cutoff. We, we marry a, a, a partner, and that's how we escape our family of origin. We, we take on some adult responsibility, and in so doing, we think about the problem is solved. I want to talk about differentiation individu individuation, what I've been building to. But before I do, the quote from James Hollis as a good reminder. So often the idea of individuation, very similar to differentiation, has been confused with self-indulgence or mere individualism. But what individual individuation more often asks of us is the surrender of the ego's agenda of security and emotional reinforcement in favor of humbling service to the soul's intent. In other words, we get rid of the task or the goal to be right or good, and we take on the role or the task of being ourselves. All right, so differentiation. This first image, it's hard to explain this without the image. So if you want copies of our slides, you can ask for copies. Just email info at evoke, or excuse, excuse me, just email info at findingyouprograms.com. Salvador Mnuchin talked about boundaries and he saw them as a continuum. On one end of the continuum, he said boundaries were rigid, too strong. And the relationship style in those families, relationships were marked by cutoff. I've had, you know, people abandoning each other. I have nothing to do with you. You make one mistake and I write you off for days, weeks, maybe forever. On the other end of the continuum, he described diffuse boundaries, right? A parent sharing with a child complaints about their spouse or the co-parent. One simple example. A parent asking the child to take care of the parent's ego. Boundaries are diffuse. And in those families, they are marked by what he called enmeshed relationships. If you could see my hands, if you're, if you're listening, you would see my hands clasped, clasped together in front of my face, overlapping. If my right hand pulls, my left hand goes with it and vice versa. That's what happens in diffuse enmeshed families. In rigid families, if you could see me, you would see my two fists about 10 inches apart, never coming into contact. And he talked about clear boundaries being connected and separate. In here, you see my two fists touching each other, but moving independently. That was Salvador Mnuchin's idea. Murray Bowen 
had an alternative way of describing a similar phenomenon. He said that families really could be seen through the lens of what he called a differentiation scale. On the zero end of the scale, families were enmeshed, fused, reactive, dependent. They were prone to overdependence or even reactive fighting and cutoff, violent, yelling, screaming, guilting, shaming, chaos. And on the other end of the continuum, on the 100 end scale of the continuum, he called it differentiation. And he said in those families, they have achieved a balance of being individuals and staying connected. In other words, intimacy, a balance between being who you are and staying connected to the other. I think this is the most interesting piece of this. And on his scale, the zero side doesn't distinguish between rigid or diffuse boundaries, between enmeshed and cut off, like Mnuchin's did. He said that's unimportant. Whether families are chaotic and fighting all the time and yelling and dependent, it's just a different style. Being a people pleaser in his world is not that much different at a basic level than always fighting and arguing. It's just a different style of a lack of separateness, a lack of intimacy, a lack of connection. And now it even gets more interesting. If you grow up in a, in a family with that family ego mass, let's say a 75, everybody in that family will be around a 75, somewhere relatively close. So if your family has a 75, that means that there are probably are 80s in your family and there are 70s in your family, just to use an arbitrary number. So when you go out in the world, let's say you are 78 because you come from this 75 family. You look for 78s or people that are close to you. You're not attracted to 48s. They are immature. They are underdeveloped. They are too needy or too chaotic or too conflictual. They're crazy. But here's where it's even wilder. If you're a 78 and you go out in the world and you find a 98, you're not attracted to them either. They seem uncaring, unloving, disconnected, too rational, too individuated. They don't come as quickly when you're crying. They don't jump into the mix with you. So while we can marry two Michelles that have some differences on the surface, whatever my number was at the time of my divorce and then getting married a couple of years later, whatever my number was, and it didn't move that much. That's what I was looking for. If I'm a 75, I'm looking for anyone between a 70 and 80. I'm not attracted to people that are 10, 15, 20 numbers off. And there's no exception to this. And you can make progress along the scale. Therapy moves you up the scale, ideally. I had a mother, a couple of mothers asked me one time, asked me in New York City at a parent support group, don't we need to explain to our children if we're moving up the scale? Because see, if you start to set boundaries, if you start to become boundary, the people in your system will accuse you of being uncaring. They'll accuse you of not loving because that's not what love looks like to a 70. Love to a 90 does not look like love to a 70. It looks like not love. So I had these, these two parents, these two women, they happen to be, and they asked me, shouldn't we explain to our children when we're moving up the scale? And I said, you can do it once or twice, but let me be clear. 90s don't explain themselves to people. And 70s can't hear a 90 anyway. It makes no sense to them. Their way of operating seems irrational. So this is kind of the crux of tonight's. I've gone a little bit of time over, but the crux is the fundamental thing that I see that, that, that defines us is this level of differentiation. If my wife is mad at me, what does my family of origin and background tell me about my responsibility for that feeling? Am I at fault? Do I need to fix it? Can I tolerate that? Can I accept it and take it in and metabolize it? 
my relationship to my child or my wife being angry at me are largely embedded in my family of origin, the family ego mass of my family of origin. Aside from how educated my parents were, how much money we made, aside from all the specific characteristics and attributes of my family, it is how close or not we were together. So when children get upset at their parents, when I'm working with a family, I watch how the parents react. And that tells me about their context. When I watch two spouses talking, I start to see the different ways in which their family of origin shaped them. You become shaped. You fit in your family of origin because you take on a certain shape to assure that you belong, that you stay in that family of origin so you can survive. You adapt to the family of origin. It's bigger than you. You need it. And you are genetically wired as a homo sapien to make sure that you do what it takes to survive. So you, you, you take on the shape. And then when you leave that foreign family of origin, I don't care how far you or fast you think you're running away from them, you find other people that fit your shape. And that really is the work of psychotherapy in family systems theory as I see it. Can you see yourself clearly? Can you take responsibility for yourself? I know you don't want to be codependent. I know you don't want to be undifferentiated. I know you don't want to have an insecure attachment. I know you don't want to have an anxiety disorder or be problematic in your self-medicating behaviors. I want all those things for myself too. But that's irrelevant. We have to come to terms with ourselves. And to do so, we have to look at our family of origin. We have to understand it. It's very difficult to be in healthy relationship with other people unless we've done significant work to understand our family of origin and its powerful impact on the shape of us. All right, the take home. Take care of yourself and deal with it. You're not responsible for what happened to you as a child. You're not responsible for your family of origin, but it's yours and it's your responsibility to deal with. Be really careful about using guilt, shame, emotional coercion, argument, intimidation, and fear as a way to control other people. That's a sign of low differentiation. In families where their differentiation is low, people are held captive by guilt and shame and fear. In families where there's high differentiation, people feel those feelings, but they are not run by them. And they're not used to try to manipulate other people. And if you grew up in a family that has low differentiation and guilt and shame and, and passive aggressive and, and covert unexpressed emotions were constantly a part of the family culture and the weather system in your family, then you're going to be attracted to people at that same level of differentiation. And as you grow out of that, as you unpack that, as you deconstruct that childhood, you'll move on beyond it. Prepare in all cases of growth for homeostasis energy. For, for what Harriet Lerner calls change back energy. Even the most well-meaning parent for that matter will resist a child's emotional growth at some level. Now, I know a lot of parents will say, not me, but I'm telling you, we can find instances. It's uncomfortable. It is a betrayal. That's why I've talked about in the past, sending a child to a residential program or a wilderness therapy program is a betrayal. Holding a line with a spouse and saying, no more. If you don't stop your drinking and get treatment, I can't be in this marriage. That's a betrayal of an old contract, one that is outdated, that needs to be betrayed. There is such thing in family systems and family of origin as a healthy betrayal. In fact, it's necessary. But then, then we have to confront parts of ourselves that we don't want to confront. Our own shame and our own guilt and our own fear. Children forgive parents as they grow up and get healthier, as they become more mature and take responsibility for their lives. But first, but first, it's important that they learn to be angry at their parents, that they understand the shortcoming of their parents, that they look critically on their childhood. Not to stay stuck and to stay a victim, but to move through it and, and heal, to be responsible for the healing going forward. So start where you're at. Start with I feel statements, which are a great illustration just on the surface of healthy differentiation. 
start with I feel statements. And as you move along in the process and it becomes more nuanced, you won't become a, a, a kind of beholden to that specific skill, but you will begin to live the principles that are embedded intrinsic to that skill. Know yourself. You know, the most important thing I can say to you is that knowing yourself means knowing the parts of you that you've been told to hate. I, I love to hear people share things in therapy that they're afraid to share, not because I'm a voyeur, but because they're telling me about something that they've been shamed into to denial, into the unconscious. They're betraying their old family system, their own family of origin, and they're telling me something, and they're taking the risk that I won't react the way their parents did, the way their earliest contexts, the big people around them did when they were growing up. Reduce shame. Focus on solutions. It's a dynamic change. And that's why somebody outside of the system, like a therapist or a sponsor, often offers the most insightful perspective because they're not in it. So they can see it. We intervene to, in order to sustain changes and to, to make it past the homeostatic, homeostatic mechanisms or energies that come at us. I've talked about this before. In, in a therapeutic sense, that the therapist cannot simply blame the lack of progress in therapy on the client. They must look at and own their own approach. They must, that's the heroic journey, folks. The heroic journey, the journey of the heroic parent, my first book, is about having the courage to look at how you might be participating in the dynamics that are making you unhappy. How you might actually be contributing to the problems in your marriage and in your relationship with your children and in your relationship with others. You might be contributing to a dynamic that you've been complaining about, but you have a part in it. And then of course, be mindful of the ecosystemic impacts of any system, the larger systems outside of the system. All right, fo folks, my two books, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, as I just talked about, and The Audacity to Be You, which I quoted earlier, are available on Amazon and Audible. Like I mentioned earlier, November 15th through 17th is the online Finding You program. Sign up soon. I'll be running the December 4th through 8th in person outside of Park City, Utah, January 15th through 19th will be the next in-person finding you. That'll be run by my daughter, Emma, Emma Reedy June and her husband. <clears throat> January 24th through 26th is the next online finding you program. I'm going to be running a conscious parenting workshop, an all day workshop for parents on January 10th, 9am to 4pm mountain time. And then I'm going to be running a masterclass on attachment based therapy for therapists and professionals and people that are more advanced in their therapy on March 7th at 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Mountain Time. Like I've mentioned all throughout, you can email us at info at findingyouprograms.com for suggestions, questions, um, for copies of the slides. <coughs> for any of our programming questions, you can reach out to us at info at findingyouprograms.com. My next broadcast will be a week from today, Tuesday, November 12th at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, I'm going to be speaking on gratitude and mindfulness, and I think that's Nice for the holiday season. One last thing before I close tonight. I, I will be trying to stream. I'm going to do my best to stream live my keynote address this Sunday at the Addiction Symposium where I'll be talking about codependency as the core of all addictions. So I'll try to do that on our, on our Facebook or Instagram live. Try to try to have my, my assistant take a, a film and a live stream of me so I can provide that for all of you who won't be in attendance as professionals. Thank you. I hope this is a helpful point of contact and I hope this provides you some hope and liberation from some of the contexts that we all grew up in. And as always, for and on behalf of the people that love you and the people that you love, thank you for showing up, listening, watching, and doing this work because it makes all the difference in the world. Have a great evening and I'll talk to you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.